tes tes yang kedengeran di zoomnya apa di sini di zoomnya kedengeran nggak denger ya eh aku minta cv-nya prof bahan tapi aku ya kan aku nggak nggak usah aku baca ya kan ini udah dijelasin di sini kok padahal udah on Heeh, uh -uh, sampai enggak bisa. Heeh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Ini soalnya tadi. Ini udah udah jelasin di sini, Om, Pak. Heeh. <laughs> uh -uh. Ini aja let us see. Nah, ini udah 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 dijelasin di sini Mbak ini. Ini sama kayak ini isinya. Jadi jadi aku nggak usah ngomong ini ya. Jadi pas like, like everyone langsung ditampilin CV-nya. Oke, okay. thank you Dr. Fia.
Halo. Halo, no. Suara saya kedengaran ya? Halo? Ini kok gak kedengaran sih? Halo? Ya, ini berang banget tanya Sudah bisa jahil atau belum? Ini dokter Kita lagi di lounge Ini dokter Odi Dokter Kutu Sudah sampai mana? Baru aja ini di batang Uh, ini perang banget tanya Udah bisa join atau belum gimana? Nunggu ya. Nunggu dokter Sari Nunggu dokter Sari Prof Bahal Masuknya nunggu dokter Sari Dokter Do Do Sari itu udah ada info belum? Kira-kira mau join jam berapa? Oke okay. Jadi info ya Ini partisipannya baru 13 Udah dibuka belum buat yang lain? Partisipannya udah dibuka belum lain? Belum. Masuk, iya. Apa nanti aja, Nud? Jam 1 aja, Nud. Ya, jam 1 aja. Oh, ya. ini ceritanya belum dibuka, ya? Jam 1 nanti baru dibuka. Oh, ini perubahan sudah join. Good afternoon, perubahan. Halo, good afternoon. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Hello. Yes, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I actually joined just now, but uh, just couldn't get through to the Zoom platform. Sorry, bro. How are you, bro? Good. Where are you? Are you in Solo or somewhere else? Somewhere else. No. Okay, all right. You should go to Natina, bro. Maybe someday. Sorry, what's that? Can you hear uh, uh, my voice? I can hear you. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we are now waiting for uh, Dr. Sari, our five years. Sorry, maybe Dr. Cesar can continue. I can hear some announcement from your flight. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Maybe I test my slides to see whether it's working or not. Yeah, uh, can I test my slides? Uh, Want me not? Since we are still waiting for others to join, can I just test my slides first? Test slide to do Okay. 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 Yes, I share my screen. Yes. Can you see my screen? My yes, we can slide? see, we can see can your see. slide clearly. Okay, good. On That's our good. screen. Uh, I'm just concerned about the videos. Maybe we are just uh, we just click okay. the video to see whether it's working or not. Okay, we can try it. Okay. Check. Can you see the video playing?
Can, can you see the video playing? Yes, Prof. We can see the video is playing. Okay, that's good. What about this one? Yes, okay, Prof. it can play it well. Here, we can see it's, the video. It's moving, right? Yes, it's moving. Fantastic. Oh, good. So I stop sharing for the time being. All right, so we are set to go. We're still waiting for our five steam, and this is huh? okay. Okay, Dr. Sari, selamat siang, dok. Selamat siang, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, salam. Ah, selamat siang, Prof. Bahar. Selamat siang, apa kabar? Ya, selamat datang di Zoom meeting ketemu. Terima Thank you. kasih. Ya. Terima kasih atas jemputannya. Oh. <laughs> Baik. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Okay. I think we can start our uh, lecture today, Prof. Oke. Okay. You want me to start straight away with the slides? Uh, we will play our uh, video profile first. Okay, sure. Saya kenal maka tak sayang. Sure, sure. Iya, yeah. kita tunggu. Selamat siang, Dr. Sari. Selamat siang. Terima kasih. Prof Bahai ini sudah ditunggu. Kita akan belajar di sini tempat ini. Dengan tawa dan sair mata menaiki semua perjalanan kita. Kita telah putuskan kita akan berjuang di sini tempat ini. Yeah. 
Sambut hari cerah Kita kan buktikan Kita kan bertahan Di sini Tempat ini Tentu kalara Dan terus melangkah Jangan menyerah Walau ragam-lara Kita adalah Manusia biasa Yang punya rasa Dan punya asa Good afternoon, Profesor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah as our speaker today, Dr. Paramasari Dirgahayu PhD, Vice Dean of Faculty of Medicine 11 Maret University, Dr. Dr. Hadi Sudrajat Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, Subspecialist Otology Consultant as the Head of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Department, Dr. Dr. Dewi Pratiwi. Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Subspecialist Otology Consultant as the Head of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Study Program. Dr. Aziza Fikisha Berliana Putri, Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery as our moderator. And all of the otorhinolaryngology specialists and also all of the audience attending today's lecture. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Bia, an otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery resident of 11 Maret University. Today, I will accompany you throughout this lecture as a host of this program. It's such an honor to welcome you to our international guest lecture. Today, we are going to have a very special speaker from University of Science, Malaysia, Professor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah, who will give lecture on hemostasis in endoscopic sinus surgery. Now, I would like to inform you all the agenda of today's lecture. We will start with listening to our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, continued by March 11 Maret University. After that, we will show you the video profile of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Study Program of 11 Maret University. Next, we will have a welcome speech by the head of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Study Program who will be represented by Dr. Dr. Hadi Sudrajat, Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, Subspecialist Otology Consultant. Then, switch from the Vice Dean of Faculty of Medicine, 11 Maret University, that will be represented by Dr. Paramasari Dirgahayu, PhD. The next is our primary agenda. There is an expert lecture from Professor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah, from University of Science, Malaysia. This session will be followed by discussion as well as question and answer session. Without further ado, let's start with listening our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, continued by Mar 11 Maret University. To all the audience inside this room, please stand up.
study program profile through this video. I'm Dewi Pratiwi. Welcome to our study program. I'm the head of Otorhinolaryngology Head and Next Surgery Study Program, Faculty of Medicine, 11 Maret University. Our study program was established in 2009, and for nearly two decades, we have graduated more than 80 new PMS specialists. We have a formed residency program, and our patients are being an Otorhinolaryngology Head and Next Surgery Study Program with international reputation and producing professional graduates with community ENT as the future program in 2010. Untuk mencapai visi tersebut, Prodi IKTHT BKL telah menetapkan beberapa misi yang meliputi aspek bidang pendidikan, penelitian, dan pengabdian. Program studi IKTHT BKL FKUMS didukung oleh para staf pengajar baik di Rumah Sakit Pendidikan Utama RSUD Dr. Muwardi maupun rumah sakit terjalin, yaitu rumah sakit UNS dan RSUD Pandanaran Boyolali yang terdiri atas 9 divisi, yaitu Otologi, Rhinologi, Neurootologi, Lareng Pareng, Bronco Esofagologi, 
onkologi bedah kepala lahir, fasial plastik rekonstruksi, alergi immunologi, dan THT komunitas. We already have a research roadmap which is in line with our vision and mission with the outcome of national and international publication. We have achieved high GPA and 100% students have passed national exams in their first attempt for the last three years. There are various amazing programs of otorhinolaryngology head and eye surgery across countries and we delightedly admit it that we are one of them. You will be proudly graduated from our study program as you have achieved great training from our reputable lecturers and we do our best to give you good, healthy residency environment. Well then, I strongly encourage you to join to our study program as we have a lot to offer and I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next term. Thank you for watching and now please Dr. Dr. Hadi Sudrajat Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery Subspecialist Otology Consultant to welcome the audience. Please Dr. Time is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. To our honorable Dr. Paramasari Dirgayu, PhD, the Vice Dean of Medical Faculty, Plus Marit University. To our honorable Professor Baruddin Abdullah from University of Science Malaysia. How are you, bro? Uh, hope you thank are you. doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Good afternoon, all my colleagues, ENT staff and residents, as well as all the participants joining this group lecture. First of all, let us let thank to God uh, for this condition and heart so that we can gather here in this special occasion. Today, we have Professor Baha as our guest lecturer, who is going to share his knowledge on hemostasis in endoscopic sinus surgery. We are honored for having you, Prof. Baha, to give your lecture and expertise that will enrich our knowledge and helps us provide better care to our patients. Thank you very much, Prof. Baha, for your time to spend here for sharing your knowledge with us. We hope we can gain valuable insight from your lectures. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam Thank you, Doctor. Next, please, Doctor Paramasari Dirgahayu, PhD, to give the opening speech. Please, Doctor, the time is yours. Oke. Okay. Terima kasih uh, kepada semuanya. Uh, selamat siang di waktu Indonesia bagian Barat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, make a permission and I will give uh, deliver my speech in Bahasa Indonesia. And I'm sure that uh, Malaysia also have uh, almost the same Bahasa 
musim Melayu. Selamat siang uh, kepada yang terhormat uh, Profesor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah uh, dari University Science of Malaysia. Selamat datang di ruang Zoom meeting yang terhormat ini. Kemudian selamat siang juga kepada Kepala Program Studi uh, THT BKL kepada Kepala Bagian uh, Kepala Departemen dari THT kepada uh, peserta atau anggota perhati yang hadir di sini dan uh, residen serta mungkin peserta uh, dokter muda dari Fakultas Kedokteran Universitas 11 Maret. Pertama-tama kami panjatkan puji syukur kehadirat Allah Subhanahu wa taala. Berkat karunia-Nya kita semua bisa berkumpul di sini dalam suasana sehat uh, walafiat dan uh, dan semuanya uh, siap uh, suka untuk uh, mengikuti lecture pada uh, siang hari ini. Uh, kita ketahui bersama uh, Prof Baha uh, program studi uh, INT THT ini uh, merupakan program studi yang uh, sudah terakreditasi unggul the level is A dan uh, sekarang sudah uh, lebih kepada peningkatan-peningkatan di uh, level uh, internasional. Oleh karena itu uh, memorandum of Ya, oleh karena itu maka Uh, peningkatan kerjasama itu di, harus diisi. Uh, salah satu kegiatan dari uh, kolaborasi uh, antara UNS dengan USM ini adalah international uh, collaboration, uh, international pakar, kuliah pakar internasional. Kemudian kami juga mengharapkan uh, adanya uh, research collaboration dan uh, mungkin ke depan uh, exchange students maupun uh, faculty exchange. Tidak Uh, berpanjang lebar ya uh, untuk workshop atau untuk uh, kuliah pakar pada siang hari ini semoga bisa berjalan dengan lancar ya uh, semoga semuanya sehat walafiat dan kami sangat mengharapkan suatu saat kita bertemu kembali dalam uh, kondisi uh, pertemuan secara uh, luring dan hal ini bisa menjadi sesuatu uh, yang kontinu dan uh, secara berkelanjutan. Dengan mengucapkan bismillahirrahmanirrahim, maka kuliah pakar uh, atau international guest lecture di bidang INT, THT, uh, Fakultas Kedokteran UNS dengan uh, pakar Profesor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah dengan ini bisa dinyatakan dimulai. Ya. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Terima kasih lebih kurangnya. Uh, next, would you please next time, uh, Profesor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah, thank you very much. Then we would like to uh, welcome you next time uh, is Blas Maret University Solo, Solo in a Culture City. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It will be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Right before we begin. We'll have some photo session together. So please to all the participants to keep your camera on and I will count to take the picture. Okay, everyone, please open the camera. Okay, slide, first slide. One, two, three. One more time, one. Two, three, last one, one. Take a smile. Three. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> to all the participants, please stay tuned to this international lecture until the end. And please fill the attendant list from the link in the chat room. Yeah, Move yeah. on to the scientific session. And this time will be hosted by Dr. Aziza Pikisha Berliana Putri, otorhinolaryngology head and neck surgery. Just before we start, allow me to inform you briefly about our moderator.
Dr. Aziza Fikisha Beriana Putri, Otorinolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, is a lecturer in 11 Maret University. She's also an active member in ENT, ENT Society. Allow me to hand over the next session to Dr. Aziza Fikisha as our moderator. Okay. Dr. Aziza, the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bia. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. I am Aziza, and it is such an honor for me to be here as the moderator for this international lecture on hemostasis in endoscopic sinus surgery, which will be delivered by Professor Dr. Baradin Abdullah. And this lecture is scheduled to last for about 45 minutes, then followed by Q&A session for 30 minutes. In order to make this le lecture run well without any interruption, please turn off your microphone during the lecture. If you have any question, you can type your question in the chat box throughout the session. But if you want to ask the question directly instead, you can do so by raising your hand during the Q&A session, but please remember you can only speak after the moderator allows you to speak. Okay, right everyone. Allow me to introduce our speakers for today's lecture. It is an honor for us uh, to have Professor Dr. Baruddin Abdullah from University Science Malaysia to share his knowledge and experience with us. Many of his studies have been published in international and international scope. And Prof. Baha is an expert in general otorhinolaryngology, head and neck surgery, rhinology, skull based surgery, and also allergy. And today, Prof. Baha will give you a lecture about hemostasis in endoscopic sinus surgery. No briefs. Uh, Prof. Baha, the time is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Um, um, Miss Moderator, yes, Aziza, and also previously the uh, chair lady just now. Um, um, I would first I would like to uh thanks the uh organizing committee and also um uh, all the heads uh of New Seas Brasmara, especially the Department of RL HNS. Uh, my congratulations to Dr. Paramasari Atta Hadi, um, Dr. Devi Prativi, Dr. Hendra Devi, Dr. Putu. I'm sorry if I can't name everybody um, by name here, but I, I, I know that um, you guys have done very well. Um, you just mm -hmm. had been uh, mm -hmm. on the right track, and I think it's going I in the right direction. Um, so, um i'm always uh, uh would be happy to um uh be involved with any program um uh, that is done by the university and probably in the future we can collaborate even more closer and in fact um we are going to have the first exchange program between the universities soon um and you know why i put up this topic um uh, as a lecture because hemostasis it has always been uh, an important um, uh, subject for, especially for us as a surgeon, um, as an otorhinolaryngology uh, surgeon, we are doing a lot of cases. Um, and when we are operating, um, we have to uh, manage and also address um, the bleeding so that we can have a better outcome for our patient. And from the beginning, whenever we talk about bleeding, uh, we must always uh, think that um, bleeding is something that we must be familiar with, especially in terms of the hemostasis. Um, and also bleeding is something that uh, like uh, our good friends, because um, we cannot be scared of bleeding. Because when we are scared of bleeding, I think probably uh, that is where some of the uh, friends and colleagues that I know of um, they can't do any surgery because if you have this sort of phobia uh, about bleeding, then for sure you cannot do uh, any surgery at all. So um, that is probably what I would like to give um, uh, in terms of the uh, opening about 
why this topic is very important because we are dealing with bleeding all the time when we are operating. So how to deal with the hemostasis and what sort of, uh, why it is so crucial whenever we do um, our surgery and especially when uh, we are talking about endoscopic sinus surgery uh, and further than that, skull based surgery being done uh, endoscopically um, it's quite common nowadays. Uh, it's not only we are doing sinus surgery, we are doing uh, skull based surgery as well together with our neurosurgeon. And when we are dealing in such a small space where we have to maneuver, we have to manipulate, uh, um, if there is a bleeding, this will interfere with our uh, surgical field. Um, and also, this also will um, uh, distort or hinder for us to identify the proper lemma. And as we all know, uh, this is one of the key important steps for us whenever we go in uh, endoscopically, we must be able to identify the anatomical lemma so that we don't get lost. Um, so whatever happens, let's say uh, when we are um, doing surgery, we encounter bleeding, we have to stop. And we have to, um, we cannot proceed with our dissection. We have to stop and we have to deal with the bleeding first before we even go further. And it has been said, uh, uh, there's a lot of reports, there's a lot of literature on that, and there's a lot of experience um, that people have uh, been uh, discussing and whatnot, that whenever you lose control of your hemostasis, you cannot stop the bleeding. This where you will encounter complication in terms of what? Because when you cannot identify your landmark, you may go to those areas that you shouldn't be going into. And we know that when we are dealing in the, we are doing surgery, we are doing instrumentation in the sinusal area, there are vital organs there. We have the orbits there, we have the skull base there, and we go further, you go to the brain and you go uh, into the carotid artery as well. And I've seen and I've heard report of uh, doctors or surgeons um, developing complica complication because of this sort of issues. So I think it goes without saying whenever we do surgery, hemostasis is of paramount importance. And how do we achieve that? Uh, realistically, we can talk about a single modality, we can talk about combined modality, but realistically, what happens is we always combine them together to have a proper control of the breathing or to facilitate our surgery in terms of getting a good outcome. All right. Um, so before I even go further, what happens if we lose our Landmark. What happens if we lose our ways when we are doing surgery? I would like to advise you, if this happens, you lose control of bleeding, you can't obtain hemostasis, the, probably the wise thing for us to do is to stop the surgery until the next time uh, we can just pat the nose and we can do the surgery another time. Because I think there will always be another opportunity for you to continue with the surgery. And this not only happened to the amateurs, to the beginners, but also happened to the experts. I've seen many times when um, the experts are performing live surgery, when they can't control the bleeding, when they lose their way, they will just stop the surgery. And I think there shouldn't be any sort of embarrassment on our part to say that we have to stop this surgery because if not, then we we'll, usually this is the sort of phase that when you continue your surgery, then probably you there are high risk of you to encounter complications. To make it easier for us to understand, I will divide the measures into three measures or three parts. Uh, what we can do preoperatively, even before uh, we start the surgery, preoperative measures. What we can do with the surgery itself, the intraoperative measures, as well as what we do before we stop the surgery, postoperative measures in terms of uh, for us to minimize the risk of bleeding. 
So let's go to the first measure, which is preoperative. Even before we plan for surgery, well, even before we go for surgery, uh, we must assess our patients accordingly. Uh, because there are patients that have comorbid um, condition. Uh, they may be taking some drugs for that patient with heart problem, coronary artery disease, for example. A uh, patient with stroke, they might be taking aspirin. They might be taking uh, anticoagulant. And we must be able to uh, identify this sort of history. We must be able to pick up uh, this sort of drug history. And we need to understand when can we stop the medication? What's the time duration for us to stop the medication? Because um, the efficacy or the, uh, the half-life of those medication is not only a day. They may be a week, they may be two weeks for us to withhold the medications. So we must know and identify what medication the patient is on. Um, apart from that, uh, it, there is a way for us to also to lessen or reduce the inflammatory burden, the local cellulosal inflammatory burden. There are techniques and also uh, measures uh, or strategy for us to uh, do that. Uh, and I, I think it goes without saying when we say that uh, we need to look at the sinus CT scan of the patient. This is our roadmap. No patient shall go to operating theater without a CT scan. Without a CT scan, you are going to endanger the patient, right? So this is a must. All patients going for endoscopic sinus surgery require a CT scan. And in fact, it has been discussed many times. It has been highlighted many times. When, whenever we want to go for surgery for such a patient, such a procedure, usually what happens is we are going to do the surgery in our mind first. By looking at the CT scan, by looking at the CT scan, we can go in our mind first. What are the steps that we must do um, for us to obtain a clearance of the disease in terms of avoiding all those critical structures and also what we can do for the patient uh, post-operatively. Um, so that is what will go through our mind. Whenever we see this is kind of the patient, we can go step by steps in what are the things that we need to do for that patient. And of course, the second surgery will be uh, the actual surgery itself. And when you do this, I'm sure, um, if you uh, encounter any problem at all during surgery, you have already uh, probably have taken measures how to uh, overcome that sort of issues interoperatively. So coming back to that issue of anticoagulant, uh, the common there are some common medication that we always encounter. We uh, uh, always patient are you know are always on when they have. Um, heart problem, they may have um, uh, several vascular accidents mm -hmm. like warfarin, uh, like aspirin. Um, and this, um, the sort of timeline that's recommended for uh, the patient to uh, withhold the medication like warfarin five days, uh, aspirin seven to 10 days. And uh, not to forget uh, the nostridal anti-inflammatory, the painkillers uh, within seven days. And usually the nostridal anti-inflammatory is not a problem for us to withhold. Uh, but usually what happens is for a patient that is on warfarin, on an aspirin, for heart problem, for um, the cerebral vascular accident, for any other call, uh, morbid medical condition, usually I consult with the respective um, uh, specialist, the respective discipline, uh, because we do not know uh, what is the risk of stopping this medication. So I think uh, what happened is I would advise before even we stop those medication, uh, for us to uh, consult with the respective uh, discipline and specialists uh, to consider whether we can stop or what, what is the uh, ideal time period for us to stop those medication. And also this is to avoid any issues that after stopping the medication, patient develop some uh, medical complications. Um, apart from the um, modern medicine, don't forget about the herbal supplement. And sometimes uh, this um, usually is not being identified uh, properly. 
because I think in the mindset of a lot of people, herbal supplement is always safe and it does not affect uh, anything. It does not affect the body. And I think that is actually um, far from the truth. Um, in terms of the herbal supplement, there are also 4Gs, like the uh, our telecommunication providers. 4Gs, which actually, um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, an abbreviation for the ginseng, garlic, ginger, and ginkgo biloba. Uh, these are the sort of um, herbal supplements that a lot of people are actually uh, use uh, are taking um and for example like ginkgo biloba which is um plant found in, in china used quite commonly um uh, among our population uh, because it increases blood circulation uh, a lot of people when they use ginkgo biloba they feel very good because of the increase in blood circulation uh, especially in we have we have also heard about patient um, having vertigo, taking it, they feel much better. Patient that has stroke might be taking and they feel uh, much better after taking this supplement because it increases the blood flow. And uh, whenever we have an uh, increase in blood flow, that that uh, person, we feel uh, that they are healthier, they are, they are more active and whatnot. But this um, herbal supplement have been identified to affect platelet function. And it must be stopped about 10 days before the surgery. And um, don't forget, a lot of Chinese medicine, a lot of Chinese medicine contain this um, supplement. Uh, and in fact, when I was in Hong Kong, um, the doctors there for any surgery, we stop the Chinese um, supplement, the Chinese herbal medicine, even one month before the surgery because they have encountered a lot of bad uh, problems arising from the use of this in terms of the out-of-control bleeding. Um, the other uh, supplement also is, for example, like sal palmato. Um, usually it's been uh, given as a supplement for um, uh, men that has sexual dysfunction, uh, men that has uh, prostate hypertrophy, uh, for balding, uh, to regain the hair back. Um, vitamin E, high doses, as well as omega-3, which is actually contained in fish oil. I know that um, a lot of people in Malaysia, especially, they are using a lot of fish oil because fish oil is supposed to give them more energy. And, and I think we need to understand that this also may play a role in terms of predisposing the patient for higher risk of bleeding. Um, and then let's talk about the how to reduce the inflammatory burden. Um, and you know that uh, steroids um, has been used quite widely, uh, whether it's topical steroids or systemic steroids. Before the surgery, um, um, there are strategies that have been used uh, quite commonly by surgeon by using topical intranasal steroids as well as systemic corticosteroids. And in fact, um, I love to use uh, steroids uh, before surgery because I think uh, it does uh, play a big role in terms of reducing the blood loss. Um, so when we talk about topical and systemic, uh, probably this depends on the surgeon's preference, whether they want to use topical, whether they want to use a systemic um, corticosteroids. And when you talk about uh, the systemic corticosteroids, there are also... Uh, different dosing, whether we want to give it like five to ten days before the surgery, or even like single pre uh, like single dosing, uh, preoperatively. Um, and I think probably this also depends on the patient profiling, whether they have minimal disease or they have extensive disease as well. Um, but uh, if like, we want to talk about the um evidence, evidence seems to be conflicting. Um, there are studies that show that the use like for example, in this study, the use of typical corticosteroids like mematosone furate, which is like Nazonex, uh, the brand name, uh, four weeks before the uh, uh, the surgery, before the procedure, it seems that the use of topical corticosteroid in the form of mematosone furate offers or provide um, benefits in terms of uh, reducing their bleeding and when we improve the we re reduce the bleeding 
Um, it also will uh, in, in helps us to improve on our surgical field and also lessen or shorten the operating time. And you know why this is so much important? Because when we have an improved surgical field, we can make sure that we have properly eradicated this disease. We, when we go in, our, our, our objective has always been to remove the disease completely. And you can imagine if you can't see very well, definitely there will be some leftover disease there. And that is not really ideal. All right. But the other thing is, um, even though we say that the use of steroid is beneficial, but other studies seems to show that uh, in this study, they are using systemic oral steroids uh, for about 10 days before surgery. And it seems in this study, uh, the use of systemic oral steroid is not really helping to reduce the bleeding. Um, I think we don't, don't let us get confused with all this conflicting evidence. I would say that this issue arises because of the uh, patient population under study. The previous, uh, the former study using topical corticosteroid, they are using patient that has CRS beef or without nasal polyps. And this uh, group of patients uh, using the oral steroid is um, the CRS with nasal polyps. And I said before, the burden of disease is also important in terms of uh, how the patient respond to what, uh, any modality that we give them, any um, therapeutic options that we give them. And I think this plays a big role, but something that we can consider in terms of minimizing uh, the burden of disease preoperatively. All right, so then uh, let's go now to the preoperative assessment. What do we look for and what sort of CT scan we must get uh, for, for us to uh, um, analyze or study um, the anatomical landmarks for patient undergoing sinus surgery. Uh, ideally, it should be a CT scan with a minimal cut of 0.5 to 1 mm section. Uh, in my hospital, I usually use the 1 mm and the best has always been the three sections of coronal, azel, and sagittal. If you don't have that, then azel and coronal is okay. And, and of course, coronal has always been the most important as compared to the other sections. Um, so you, I'm, I'm sure you guys understand or remember the close mnemonic uh, to um, remember what are the important structures for us uh, to go through when we are reading the CT scan. Uh, the cricriform plates, we look at the uh, level of the cricriform plates. This structure is when um, uh, we are going into the frontal recess while dissecting along the frontal recess. And you might encounter this if you're not careful. If it's too low, you do cannot identify that you might breach into the uh, cranium and uh, injure the brain. Um, the laminar preparation when we are dissecting um, along the MOTs, anterior and posterior MOT, if there is a dehiscence, even though we don't put an, in any sharp instrument, even a suction itself can cause damage because the suction can uh, pull out the uh, periorbital fat and can easily damage the uh, medial rectus muscle, which is uh, very hard for us to repair. Uh, on this cell, which is a posterior extension of the posterior and moderate cell into the sphenoid. Uh, how do we identify on this cell? This is how we look, it looks like. If you see any horizontal septa or septation uh, inside the sphenoid sinus, this is should be suspected as on the anti-proven otherwise. And this is how on the looks like on CT scan, coronal view. It looks like there is a horizontal septation in the sphenoid sinus. And the relevance or the importance of identifying on this cell is that because the optic nerve is very close here. And if you're not careful, we are dissecting and then we thought that uh, this is still within the amount uh, sinus. And if we want, if there are like polyps there, we are trying to clear the polyps. If you're not careful, you might injure uh, the optic nerve, especially if it is dehiscent. Um, and we also need to look at the sphenoid sinus, the scar base. Um, and I think for the beginners, for the trainers, um, 
I think it's very well. It's very good if they can have a look at the sagittal section of this scan and they can understand the contour of the scar base. The scar base entirely is always high. But when we go more posturally, it's going to slope down. Uh, it's going to slope down and it's going to be lower. So let's say when we are doing the first lamin uh, the, uh, the first lateral, uh, I mean the first lamella dissection, which is the ansenic process, we're doing ansenectomy. Then we go posturally to the second lamina, the basal lam, um, I mean the uh, the bulla, we are doing obula and modectomy. And then we go in even more posturally, we are actually in, going to encounter the scar base because the scar base is sloping downwards and become lower. So if you are not careful, uh, you might going to puncture the scar base and injure the brain as well. Um, a model artist portion need to be identified and we need to recognize where it is uh, along the scar base. I will talk more further about this. So um, uh, uh, to make it uh, shorter or to make it simpler, just remember the, uh, the close mnemonic in terms of how we uh, read the CT scan apart from the other uh, uh, analysis that you like to make in terms of the extent of the disease, uh, in terms of the involvement of the sinuses and, and whatnot. Now, um, let's go into the interoperative measures. Um, so, this is the sort of strategies that we can uh, employ uh, and also apply for our patient. Uh, patient positioning during surgery, when the patient is lying on the OPT table, uh, the use of vessel constrictors, whether topical or injection, uh, the general anesthetic techniques, surgical techniques, as well as nowadays uh, there are newer agents uh, being used, especially in terms of the pharmacotherapy like tranexamic acid. Uh, it has been used in the form of systemic as well as topical. And also uh, I had the experience of using hot saline irrigation as well. Let's go into details about all these measures. So, studies have shown that when we elevate the patient heads, uh, this is what we call as the reverse trilembic positions, uh, it tends to reduce the blood flow from the heart to the head. And thus, we, when there is a reduced blood flow, it tends to also reduce blood loss. And the minimal elevation, and people have measured, people have done some studies, they have they made a measurement, and they have shown that uh, when you elevate the heads a minimum of 10 degrees, this is helpful uh, to improve the surgical field uh, without compromising the cerebral perfusion. And you can go, we can go from 10 to 30 degrees head elevation. Uh, usually I don't go that high up. Usually I think a minimum of 10 is good enough uh, because if it goes too high up, it's not um, very comfortable, especially when we are doing surgery over a long time, uh, and it's going to be a bit tiring uh, for us to position ourselves. So usually uh, you can choose your own position, and I think it really helps. Whenever I do surgery, I usually elevate the patient heads a little bit. Uh, then uh, I think at the most I use 15 degrees head elevation. Now, uh, what about the topical water constrictors? Um, it seems that um, there are a lot of options uh, that we can use. Uh, adrenaline is there, ozimetazoline, phenylephrine, cocaine. All right. Um, in my hospital, I use Moffat solution, which is a combination of cocaine, adrenaline, and sodium bicarb. Uh, we mix this uh, two mil cocaine, 10% cocaine, one mil of adrenaline, uh, one in 1000, and sodium bicarb, about two mil. So we mix this in the, in the saline. We use about 10 cc of that. We um, uh, put it, uh, apply it on the uh, packing material, either gauze or the neuropathy. Uh, and then we pack inside the nose. And usually the packing is about once or twice, um, uh, depending on the needs. Um, but I know that uh, at other places, they, are also, um, they also use these other uh, options. Uh, just to um, let you all know that uh, even though it seems that if we can combine these modalities, it may offer better um, outcome. 
Uh, but bear in mind that is uh, study have shown that when we combine adenine and ozimatazine, it's opposed each other. Uh, so then probably you're not going to get any good outcome from that. So just be careful if you think about com combining them uh, together. All right, and also bear in mind uh, if you are using some material of packing that is very observant, probably then uh, the mucosa contact of those the the efficacy of that medication or the mucosa probably going to be lesser even though we expect that it's going to work wonders it's going to have a very good efficacy uh, the uh, material that we use also may influence uh, the outcome so bear that in mind as well um now what about the injection um surprisingly even though i know that uh, whenever we do a surgery we always tend to give some injection probably to have a better uh, in terms of reassurance that we can control the bleeding and especially the injection along the mini terminate this is a common practice uh, everywhere i believe um mini terminate uh, enterobatrous injection um using uh, linocaine adrenaline um and the the lateral nasal wall along the lateral nasal wall uh, in the spinopartine foramen and also people have been giving injection through the oral cavity at the greater platinum can canal in the, um, you know, area. And with the belief, with the belief and with the objective to have better control of the hemostasis. But surprisingly, um, if we already pack the nose using topical uh, vessel constrictor by packing, uh, adding this injection, it seems do not really confer any additional benefit. So something for us to ponder on, something for us to think about, something for us to consider. Um, because evidence has been uh, said that, uh, has shown that um, probably the use of topical water considers is good enough. We may not even need to uh, give a local anesthetic injection anymore. Uh, Actually, in fact, um, nowadays, uh, initially, when I first started to do endoscopic sinus surgery, I always pack and also give um, some uh, local injection. But um, nowadays, I just do the packing. If um, one time does not work, I pack another time, twice. Uh, and I have stopped uh, completely uh, giving uh, any local anesthetic nowadays to my patient. Um, and the studies showed that... Um, it's um, an old studies, but still a, a good one uh, because it shows that if we use uh, topical packing, um, um, the, this is these studies look at the patient using topical and also injection. And it seems that uh, if we use topical, it's good enough for our patient because it has equal outcome. Both of them are good in terms of controlling the hemostasis. Now, what about the general anesthesia? Um, so this is uh, the modality that we need um, the cooperation of uh, our anesthetist. Um, this is what we call as control hypotension, where we need to ensure that the systolic blood pressure is between 80 to 90, um, and the heart rate is between 70 to 80. And also, if you look at the MAP, um, it is at this um, sort of measurement, 50 to 60 millimeter mercury or 30 degrees or 30% reduction of baseline of the MAP. Um, and I think it makes sense because as you know, this is the sort of um, uh, formula. And we know that um, our blood circulation always depends on the heart rate as well as the systolic blood pressure or the blood pressure. And we can control these modalities uh, for I'm sure that it will help. It will help for us to control the bleeding as well. And I know that some people will even request the anesthetist to even go lower than this. Um, probably cystic blood pressure 70, uh, um, the heart rate, um, just keeping at 70. Uh, but bear in mind that um, uh, the anesthetist is not going to be very happy uh with us because uh, they also uh you know have to make sure that there is uh, enough cerebral perfusion for the patient and especially if patient has comorbid medical condition then we have to also consider the risk of uh to that patient as well 
Um, now, surgical techniques. Um, and I think as a surgeon, this is what we must always uh, think about, uh, what sort of techniques that we're going to um, use in our patient. Um, whenever we talk about endoscopic sinus surgery, we must know that uh, if we are uh, um, managing patient, we are treating patient with inflammatory condition, for example, nasal polyps, we are going in as um, you know, uh, we are doing a functional surgery. And thus, when we are doing functional surgery, we cannot um, do a lot of damage on the mucosa, especially the mucosa of the paranasal sinus, because paranasal sinus needs to work and function. If we strip the mucosa off the sinuses, there won't be any function left. And that is why we need to make sure that we don't do stripping of the mucosa Whenever we go in, we cut the, we remove the polyp, we must ensure that the mucosa of the sinuses are well preserved as much as possible. Um, and in my hospital, in my center, I also, since we have the navigation system, and I think uh, the use of navigation also helps uh, in the confidence of the surgeon uh, and also helps in terms of teaching to the resident to also offer them uh, some confidence uh, if, let's say, they encounter any difficulty uh, in doing the procedure. So this is going to be very helpful. Uh, and especially if you are doing tumor surgery, it's going to help us if we have uh, any difficulty, uh, especially in identifying the anatomical lemma. Because when we have uh, a tumor, uh, so when we are doing a tumor surgery, tumor can distort, uh, can make the um the you know alter the anatomical landmark, and sometimes we can't really uh, rely on the uh, normal landmark for us to, uh, um, to ensure that we are in the right place and the right location, um, and as, as always I mentioned, we need to do uh we need to identify and recognize the surgical landmark. If not. If this is lost, then uh, we can't really proceed. And if you still proceed, most likely that we're going to uh, cause uh, some damage and also probably un un unwanted complications. Uh, for the trainees and beginners, I would like to show some of the instruments that I use. You don't really need um, a lot of instruments. Usually, I use some blunt instruments, like for example, freer, cotton. I love cotton. I use um, the J curet, the antrum curet for uh, dissection um, in the amoxicillin sinus, especially. Um, I use some um, ball probe, especially if I want to identify the frontal recess. Um, um, the free suction is also quite uh, helpful, especially for uh, when we do a blunt dissection. Um, and if there is a suction to um, remove the blood, uh, it will better a good uh, advantage in terms of for us to um you know proceed with the dissection in, in the presence of blood um i use a lot of microdeprider for my sharp dissection a lot have been said about microdeprider uh, a lot of surgeons can't live without the brider some surgeons say don't use microdeprider because uh, it can cause a lot of complication i believe that no instrument <laughs> is dangerous only surgeon is dangerous all right so uh, remember that no instrument is dangerous. Only surgeons are dangerous. What happened, I believe, is this. When the, the surgeon is not familiar with any instrument and they still want to do this sort of surgery, that's where the complication will happen. Uh, because if, let's say, you are dissecting using mercury prider along the amount uh, area, which is very close to the orbit, if there is a dehiscent, um, you know, microbiota has a very a good suction, high pressure suction. And if you're not careful, you go along the amoid uh, region without realizing there is a dehiscent, you can easily suck away the periorbita. And in fact, it can also injure uh, the medial rectus muscle. I, I know uh, some uh, cases that whereby uh, the surgeons are using microbiota. Um, um, and in um, uh, in a polypectomy case, and he didn't realize that he was at the in the intraorbital area, and he just keep on clearing uh, the inside the orbit, 
uh, he thought that probably the periorbita was uh, some uh, polyps tissues there. He keep on removing the periorbita and in fact, he also has cut the optic nerve as well. And I think uh, it makes sense. If you're not familiar with this instrument, you do not know where you are. I, I advise you, don't proceed. If you're not familiar with the instrument, don't proceed. And how do we use these instruments? So we have Carison punch. I also love Carison punch, especially if you need to uh, um, do uh, bony dissection. Uh, especially at the spinot, spinot can have a lot of tough bone. Carison can do a very good dissection around there. And also, it will also, uh, this instrument can also avoid any unintentional injury to the anterior structure because there is um, um, uh, the, um, the, the anterior end here which protect the anterior structure. So you don't cut any uh, anterior structures, like for example, vessels or whatnot. So you just cut the target tissues that you want to cut. The use of black sleeve forceps, whether it's uh, the blunt one, the cut forceps, or the cutting forceps. All right. So um, this sort of instrument must be used like when we use our hand. When we use our hand to eat, we use fork and spoon. Similarly, also, uh, when we use this instrument, it should be used like that. When we use fork and spoon, we have that sort of tactile feel. Tactile means T-A-C-T-I-L. Tactile where we feel with our instrument, even though it's not our hands, but we feel when we cut the tissues, when we are dissecting, it's as if these instruments are like part of our hands. So we must have that sort of sensation. We must have that sort of feeling when we use this instrument. It's just an extension of our hand doing the dissection. So if you can have this sort of sensation you develop this sort of um you know experience uh, i'm sure your dissection will be trouble free and you can do a proper dissection you can remove all those uh target tissues you can remove and eradicate all those uh disease part without any issues and usually i use this instrument with the zero degree telescope uh, as well as the 30 degree telescope um, I hardly use the 45, I hardly use the 70 degrees, and even the 30 degrees I use um, usually for my endoscopic dacrosystorhinostomy uh, cases, and also when I do a dissection along the frontal recess area. Otherwise, I use the zero degrees. Reason being, because if you use uh, the angle telescope, like for example, the 30 degrees, 70 degrees and whatnot, the dissection is not going to be easy because you have to really orient your instruments. If you are using angle telescope, you also need to use angle instrument. If not, your um, your line of dissection and your line of vision won't match. It won't correspond. And it's not going to be easy. I can tell you for sure, doing instrumentation using angle instruments is not going to be easy. Uh, even though I've been uh, doing a lot of, uh, you know, procedure using this instrument, I still don't like it. And usually, if possible, I always use the zero degrees telescope. Um, and I've been telling you about how we might need to identify the landmarks and whatnot. And this is the one of the reason, this is just one of the argument why this is very, very important. The one of the landmarks that we can use for our uh, dissection is the middle terminate. All right, the middle terminate will be there, and we know where we are medial or lateral. Then let's say if patient is a recurrent case, uh, the middle terminate has been done. The you know the middle has been removed previously. So what are the other anatomical landmarks that we can use? Do not be frightened. Do not be scared. Do not worry. Because besides the middle terminate, there is also the orbit and the orbital floor. If you, can, if you look here, if you have the orbits here, uh, this is the orbital floor. All right. And this is the middle, um, the mesi sinus. This is the amort sinus. And this is the sphenoid sinus. And this is what I was telling you about why, why the, the, the sloping of the scabies which is high anteriorly, but when we go posteriorly, it becomes, it goes lower down, it slopes downwards like this. 
So when we go from anterior to posterior along our dissection, if you're not careful, you're bound to come across the skull base because it's going to come lower down. It's going to come go lower down. And, um, and it has been um, shown that if we use the orbital floor as our landmark, we identify the orbital floor and we follow the orbital floor posteriorly. All right. So we and then first we identify the orbital floor and we flow we follow the orbital floor posteriorly to the spinal sinus. You are going to avoid the scalpis because the scalpis is still high up and the orbital floor will always be lower than the scalpis. Remember that. that Orbital floor is always lower than the skull base. And if we follow the orbital floor posteriorly, you're not going to come across the skull base and you can identify the spinal sinus just by following the orbital floor. All right. And I've done a systematic studies and I found that all those studies have shown that the orbital floor is really a reliable and really useful a landmark for us to use during our uh, dissection. Uh, what about the uh, amyloid artery? Um, I'm not sure whether um, you know that the anterior medial artery can also um, be positioned lower. Um, um, it can be at, at the distance from the scar base. And uh, in this system review, I, I actually identified that um, the anterior medial artery can be uh, divided into three types, um, type A, type B, and type C. Type A is where the anterior is embedded inside the skull base. Um, B is almost similar like this. It's just that there is a little bit of protrusion underneath the skull base, but it's still well protected in the bone. And there is this type C, whereby it is hanging in the mesentery. Now you can imagine if the, um, the this is the anterior medial artery, this is what we call as the uh, amoidal um, nipple or the amoidal foramen. Uh, this is where the anterior artery is actually at the skull base. This is well protected. Uh, if you are doing the section in the amoids, uh, probably if you don't go high, too high up, uh, you're not going to injure the anterior medial artery, but if it is lower down and you do not recognize that, you're going to cut this because it's in the mesentery uh, when we are trying to remove the nasal polyp as much as possible. The nasal polyp might be here and you, if you are using some instrument to cut uh, at this region, uh, you're bound to cause injury to the entire model artery. Um, so, uh, apart from the systematic review, I also did... Um, um, a study in our patients, uh, in Malaysian patients, uh, in terms of the types of anterior medial artery, in terms of the uh, why the uh, what is the uh, determinants of the position of the anterior medial artery, and it seems in Malaysian patients, uh, if patient has this supraorbital amoidal cells, all right. So when we look at the CT scan. Uh, we are going from anterior posterior using this coronal section, and we see some cells that going upwards uh, above the orbit like, like this. Cells that emote uh, a cell that goes above the orbit like this. This is the supraorbital uh, emot cell, which is a superior extension of the anterior emot cell into the orbit. All right. So when you see cells like this, be careful, be forewarned that the risk of anterior mortality probably will be lower. So I hope you can get what I'm trying to convey here. If you see a CT scan like this, there is a presence of supraorbital and mineral, uh, supraorbital amount as cells. Probably you need to consider that uh, you need to assume that the anterior artery will be positioned lower. All right. So they, this is what the studies show. And I think um, probably this is one of the things that we need to also see uh, in the scan in the scan of the patient. And also when we go in, be careful. 
So what happened when we injure the city, um, the atrial renal artery? This is what happens. You can see bleeding there. Okay. So usually when we see the anterior medial artery, it's always, this is the orbit, this is the septum, uh, this is the lateral lamella of the cruciform plate. And usually what when we see the anterior medial artery is always from posterior lateral to the anterior medial. It exits the anterior medial form, foramina, incites the orbit, and it goes into the lateral lamella. If there is a partial injury, don't be scared. We can always diatomize it. We can always stop the bleeding. The bleeding is not a problem uh, if we injure the anterior and medial artery. The issue, as always, is if it's a complete, complete cut of the uh, artery. What happened is this end, this end here, we retract into the orbit. This end here, we retract into the cranium or intracranially. And there will be bleeding inside the orbit and there will be bleeding inside the cranium. Um, and I hope you know that if there is a retroorbital hemorrhage or hematoma, this will cause pressure on the optic nerve and you only have 90 minutes, one and a half hours to address that. If we wait beyond that, the patient will have blindness. All right. So let's say this happened and there is retroorbital hemorrhage. We can always bring down the La lamina paparesia here, all right? So since we already open up this region here, we can always do um, orbital decompression. We bring down the um, medial wall of the orbit. Uh, we do a three horizontal uh, incision on the orbit. So then this will reduce pressure on the orbits to prevent optic nerve damage. Okay, let's go on to the skull-based classification. I'm sure everybody aware about the close classification where we see uh, in terms of the how deep is the uh, the uh, crit reform plates. Um, and you know, this is the lateral lamella, which is the thinnest bone. I, I think they have, it has been uh, measured as about 0.3 mm. So uh, the thinnest uh, area at the scabies, which is the lateral lamina, is about 0.3 mm. Um, you don't need any uh, heavy instrument to do damage here. You just put in anything there. It's going to cause uh, penetration inside the uh, the brain. And uh, the risk is higher if the keros is lower down. And this is the region usually when we do a frontal recess dissection. Uh, there are three types, keros 1, 2, 3. Uh, according to their measurement, um, uh, one to three, uh, type one, type two is um, four to seven, more than eight is uh, type three. Uh, in Malaysian population, uh, we don't have type three, luckily, and fortunately, we have only type one and type two. This has been corroborated in my study. Uh, it has been also corroborated by another study in Kuala Lumpur, uh, one of my friend's hospital. And we don't, it seems that we don't have any type three heroes. Uh, I also saw one of the studies coming out from Indonesia. It seems our population is almost the same. Uh, I see that even in Indonesian population also, there's no Kiros type 3. So fortunately, we don't have any high-risk case in terms of the low-lying uh, Kiros. Um, but then if you look at the, the angle of the amort roof here, so we have the crit reform plate and we also have the amort roof here. So the amort roof is actually sloping, right? It's sloping laterally like that. And that, that is why uh, there is another classification being termed as Jira classification or angle classification. Uh, this is um, uh, being um, uh, created or being proposed uh, by pa uh, Professor Paolo Castanovo, um, the scalpel surgeon from Italy. And he, um, uh, the, the group has proposed that we also need to uh, um, have to uh, probably know also there is a degree of uh, angulation here whereby if um, it becomes lower down, then the risk is higher. And you can see that actually the Kiros is not in the straight line, it's uh, angling like this. So they come up with this sort of angle classification. Um, and I also have the opportunity to look into this issue of the scalpis injury. 
Um, and I work with uh, my good friend, Professor Kongkiat Sini Wong from Thailand, uh, Professor Di Yu Wang from Singapore, and all my co-investigators here. So we are um, using orbital floor as our um, uh, landmark, and we measure the, uh, the roof, we measure the kidney plates from this orbital floor. And we can see uh, there are patients that has this sort of measurement, temp MN and above, um, for both of these measurements. Yes, miss. Type 2 is a moderate risk. Um, and the uh, type 3 is the high risk, whereby both of them, both of them are less than 10 mm. And this is the um, considered as high risk. So why do we choose 10 mm? Because, you know, when we are using the Blakesley forcep and, and a lot of our medical instruments, uh, their cutting or the depth of the cut is about 10 mm. I hope you realize that. And that is why we come up with this classification. So when we are going in, uh, we're working along the orbital uh, region near the skull base. Bear in mind about this measurement because our forceps, our cutting instrument is about 10 mm. So if the measurement is less than that, we have to be careful, especially in type 3 um, classification. Um, you have to proceed with uh, extra caution. And also probably perhaps you need to use a smaller instrument. And we also believe that uh, our classification can help to complement. We are not saying that um, this TMS classification, we label it as TMS classification. We are not saying that uh, TMS is better than KROS. We are not saying that uh, TMS is uh, better than uh, the JIRA or angle classification. We are saying that uh, it can complement uh, the other classification because um, if we are talking about JIRA and KROS, it's only uh, the measurement in the CT scan. But when we are going intraoperatively, we need to know what is the, where is um, the nose uh, areas away from our cutting instrument or our surgical instrument. So if we have something in mind about whether it's more than 10 mm, whether it's less than 10 mm, so when we are using that section, we use some surgical instrument in that uh, area, then we know uh, where we are and we know where we should go in, where we shouldn't go in, where we should cut, where we shouldn't cut. All right, so I hope we uh, you understand uh, where we can uh, use this sort of classification when we are considering the other type of classification as well. Okay, so the newer techniques or strategy uh, in obtaining intraoperative um, hemostasis is the use of tranexamic acids. So um, in the literatures, people have been using, uh, surgeons have been using uh, intra as, a, as, um, you know, uh, as an intravenous method. Uh, and also they have used it as uh, in topical methods. And both of them, it seems, uh, uh, provides good hemostasis, reduce the bleeding, um, as well as uh, improve the surgical feel. Um, so this uh, transmit acid, as you know, that transmit acid has been used quite widely uh, to manage epistasis as well, the spontaneous epistasis, uh, to manage hemorrhage in patients uh, following motor vehicle accident. And nowadays, um, surgeons have been using tranexamic acids. Um, I know that in um, other, besides ENT, um, uh, other surgeons also been using tranexamic acids. And now people have uh, found that uh, the use of tranexamic acid offer some benefits in terms of the hemostasis uh, for patients undergoing endoscopic sinus surgery. So I had the uh, opportunity to join uh, my colleagues here. Uh, this study has been done at the center where uh, they use topical tranexamic acid uh, in the packing, right? So they compare, uh, they use metal cell and they wet the metal cell with the 5 mil, 500 milligram of tranexamic acids, compare it against um, the gold standard of um, uh, constrictor, which is the Moffat solutions uh, interoperatively, as well as they 
pack the nose uh, post operatively um comparing against saline um you know this uh, boster goss right sorry uh pack with merosel again um uh, one um with normal saline and the other one with merosel initially they pack the nose um uh, using a uh, ribbon gauze okay one nose um tranexamic acid and the other nose using uh, morphet solutions okay and they found out that uh, the topical tranexamic acid does offer benefit in terms of controlling the bleeding but it seems that the post operative bleeding is more uh, the control of post operative bleeding is more than the intra operative bleeding what about the hot saline irrigation? I'm not sure whether uh, you have come across um, any anyone that has been using hot saline irrigation, but uh, it has been uh, used for uh, as a treatment for postural epistaxis and also to control interoperative bleeding uh, during adenomyectomy. And the mechanism, this is the postulation of the mechanism. Uh, so if there is when we uh, irrigate inside the uh, nasal mucosa, there will be edema, there will be interstitial mucosal edema because of dilatation, dilations. And when there's a mucosal edema, it causes compression of the blood vessel lumen. And when there's a compression of the blood vessel lumen, there will be reduced blood flow in the surgical field. And the other postulation is uh, has been uh, believed that uh, when during the uh, hot saline irrigation, there will be release of the clotting factors. I'm not really sure whether this has been proven, but this is the sort of mechanism that has been believed uh, to occur when we are using hot saline irrigation. What about the temperature? Hot saline irrigation has been used about 40 to 49 degrees. Um, that is why I said uh, it is a hot saline irrigation rather than warm saline because the temperature that we use usually needs to be quite hot. It cannot be just look warm. Warm probably is not going to be uh, uh, as good as if it is hotter. All right. So hot sun irrigation, it seems to be as effective as topical trainism as in uh, endoscopic sun irrigation. And there's, um, there is a study that compares these methods. Um, and this is one of the, I would say, the key um, study in terms of uh, this coming from uh, Canada. Uh, and they've shown that um, with the use of uh, hot saline irrigation, 49 degrees Celsius, compared to room temperature saline, which is 18 degrees Celsius, this gives a very good outcome in patient, uh, especially if the surgery is longer than two hours, right? Probably shorter surgery doesn't make any difference, but uh, if you're doing longer surgery, probably you are doing more extensive surgery, this uh, uh, makes a lot of um, there's a significant difference and it offers a lot of benefits. I also have done a, a systematic review uh, with my other uh, investigators here. Uh, we look into the uh, four database, um, this four database. Uh, what we found that uh, one article used 50 degrees Celsius uh, of normal saline, two articles used 49. So all of them are quite a uh, hot temperature. All right, so there, um, and we found that um, if we want to uh, offer and uh, provide a proper hemostasis using hot saline, uh, the temperature must be above 48 degrees uh, centigrade or Celsius. Um, but then again, um, if it, uh, the saline is too hot and if we are doing scalp surgery, um, and, and we ha I've, I've discussed this with, with the neurosurgery, they said, uh, there's no way that we can uh, do this because it's going to fry the brain. And we um, actually, um, um, you know, come to the um, um, big way. Um, then we say that um, probably we can just uh, give around 40 to 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, because it's too hot, it might cause some damage to the brain. And how do we um, do this? We uh, usually uh, do... Uh, we put it in 20cc saline and we flush every 10 minutes, right? Um, it goes without saying that the nurse, uh, you know, in the operating theater, we have um, uh, the, boiler, uh, the boiler where we can put in uh, all those, um, you know, bottles in and we need to measure and keep the temperature at that point. 
Uh, if not, then the you know whatever we use is going to be of uh not of benefits, right? So um need to also remember uh because sometimes when we use it after some time uh the the water or the saline is going to be cold and probably is not going to offer of any benefit. So you can see here the three studies that shown all of them shown that uh if you can use hot saline. Is uh can offer better outcome than if you use normal sun, uh, the, the room temperature normal sun irrigations. Um, so let's go through the cases. Um, so I'm sure that if you are doing endoscopic science, this is one of the common cases that you are going to uh perform this sort of surgery, and especially if this this patient has um CRS nasal with the type two, uh the insulin fluid types. Um, so this gentleman, 64 years old, uh, as always, patient that has comorbid is always is tough and difficult and very challenging, especially when they have um, medical condition like atrophibulation, requiring warfarin. We need to stop that warfarin first at least uh, five days beforehand. Uh, this patient a long time already having this problem because I think probably people, uh, a lot of people don't want to deal uh, because of the medical condition and also because of the extensiveness of the um, uh, nasal polyps of the sinusitis. Uh, the CT scan, as you can see, uh, looks um, uh, very extensive. All the sinuses are involved and everywhere you can see is all polyps. Um, and to begin with, even beforehand, pre-operatively, the hemoglobin pre operative is even low. Um, I'm not sure why, uh, but there you are. We have all this sort of uh, negativity against us. We have a lot of challenges beforehand. Um, and luckily we managed to um, do something for her, for him, uh, only requiring one pint of Paxel. And he, we were able to discharge him uh, one day post-operatively, which is, I would say, very good outcome. We were expecting a lot of uh, problems, but luckily in the end, we managed to do quite well. Um, so this is what happened in this, this patient. When we are doing the maxillary anthrostomy, this is the right side, this is the left side. You can see um, we can't get better than this in terms of the hemostasis. Uh, there are a lot of oozing uh, because um, nasal poly is quite, um, uh, um, you know, um, very inflammatory conditions. Um, and you know that the nasal poly is blocking uh, the nose. I don't think that even we give uh, uh, the nasocorticosteroid sprays, it really goes inside the sinuses. So probably that's what happened. Uh, uh, probably that's not the, the use of the corticosteroids is not going to be really helpful. Um, and you can see that uh, we are actually going inside the uh, right maxillary antrum, uh, but because of the presence of the nasal um, the polyps, uh, the antrum is not well uh, formed or not well structured. Um, even though we are already there, it doesn't look like a mesri antrum. All right. And this always is the difficulty when we have bleeding, uh, distorted anatomy, uh, especially long term. Patient has a long term uh, nasal polyp, chronic rhinosinusitis. Everything looks uh, distorted. And in the presence of bleeding, it makes worse. It makes the situation worse, and you can see that I actually went in inside the um. Sorry, I went in inside the medri uh antrum. Um, I'm sorry. I actually uh this is not the normal video. This um video that I fast forward uh twice because I don't want to waste a lot of time. Um, I usually my series is not as fast as this. It's slower than this. Um, so I go in inside the medri antrum. Uh, but because of the presence of the poly, you don't see very well. All are thickened structures, uh, but you have to trust me, this is the medri antrum. And I use um combination of micro instrument as well as micro debrider. All right. Um, so you know that when you are using micro debrider, you have to be careful, especially if you are uh, around the orbits. Uh, otherwise, in this region, it's quite safe for us to use a micro debrider. Um, and these are uh, the left sides. The left side is better than uh, the right sides. Uh, over this region, when I was um, opening the uh, left um, antrum, 
we can see much better. And over this side, you can see some discharge coming up. All right, you can see there some discharge coming up. This is like the uh, thick, implicit discharge because it's been there for quite some time. Uh, now you can see uh, the antrum there has been cleared of all those uh, thick mucosa. All right. Now you can see the thick uh, secretions there, thick discharge, pus discharge um, in the left mesial antrum. And now perhaps you can see after the removal of the discharge, all the thick discharge there together with the um, uh, thick uh, mucosa. And so there's a polyp there inside the uh, right or the left mesial antrum. Now you can see the mesial antrum very well. All right. Um, so um, this is the sort of um, cases probably you're going to come across if we are doing um patient that has uh, an extensive nasal polyps. And this is the, uh, when I was dissecting around the frontal region. And this is the sort of uh, time when uh, I changed my telescope from zero degrees uh, to the angle telescope. Uh, usually I prefer to use a 30 degrees telescope. But in some cases also, I tend to use 45 or even 70 degrees. But if let's say I want to identify, I use that 45 and 70 to ident identify the frontal recess. But if during that session, I change back to 30 degrees or even uh, the zero degree. Uh, you need to uh, use the angle instruments here. Uh, even the Blakesley, you need to use the Upton Blakesley uh, to do uh, the session around the frontal recess area. And um, you, you, uh, when we are doing a uh, dissection around this region, bear in mind, uh, the lateral part is quite safe. But if you go to the medial part, is where the lateral lamella is, and we have to be careful. All right. So this is why I don't like to use angle telescope because you see, can see now we are going from below upwards like that. It's not easy even to visualize this area, and th this is where. Usually, we can find the frontal recess. And usually, what I will do is, if I say um, I this is the middle turbinate, usually, I open up a little bit here. I cut away some of this, um, uh, this axilla of the middle turbinate here, about uh, 5 mm, because this will offer a better uh, access for us to go inside the frontal recess. All right. You can see that there is, I'm, I hope that you can see that it's quite dark. Um, but uh, there's a lot of tissues, there's a lot of polyps there, and we have to clear that before we can even see uh, the frontal recess. And how do we know that it's the frontal recess? Because when we put in the scope there, you can see the uh, the wall is going upwards like that. It's like vertically upwards, and we know that that is the frontal recess of the frontal sinus. All right. Uh, now, what about the sphenoidectomy? Uh, and I, I mentioned to you about uh, the use of the orbital floor uh, as our landmark to go posteriorly. Now you can see uh, this is the left maxillary antrum, and that is the orbital floor. All right, this is the middle turbinate. I'm going medially to the sphenoid, medial to the uh, middle turbinate. There's still a lot of polyps there. Polyps are everywhere. There's no escaping polyps. And I use, I use my orbital floor, if you can see there, again, again, this the, uh, sorry. Okay, um, I'm actually at uh, the video part of the middle terminate. Let me fast forward this to show you where I am, sorry. Sorry, okay. So now, okay. So now this, this is the orbital floor. And when I go into the sphenoid sinus, I always maintain uh, my line of the section below the orbital floor here. All right. So that's what I mean by using the orbital floor as one of your landmarks. So when I go in there, I know that the orbital floor is here and the orbital floor is always lower than the scalpel. So I can easily go there. I know this is the orbital floor. I know that even though I go in line in here because I do not know really uh, where I am. But then I know that the orbital floor is there. I can still go in, but I'm making sure that I'm below the orbital floor so that I don't injure the scalpel. So this is what I mean by using 
uh, orbital floor as one of the uh, landmarks. So now you can see that when I go posteriorly, uh, now I'm actually uh, blindly dissecting, but I know where, where I am because I'm still below the orbital floor. All right. And you can see that uh, this orbital floor is there. Now is the spinot sinus here. And spinot sinus is still below the orbital floor. You can see the orbital floor is here. And no where I am. Sorry, bro. Can you hear my voice clearly? I think we lost our uh, connection. Can Can you hear me just now? Uh, still not clear here. Uh, but can you hear me just now? Uh, please. Uh, can you repeat? Uh, just now when I was presenting, can you hear me? Um. Uh, I think the connection is weak here. <laughs> yes, but now can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I I can hear you clearly right now. Yeah, but just now, uh, where did I left off? Uh, where did I, I stop before it breaks out? Sampai mana tadi? Which which slide is that? At the end of the of your video about the. Sphenoid, sphenoid exome. Uh, okay, the sphenoid sinus and also the uh, dot bitter floor, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so, sorry. So we were here just now, right? Uh, I think the slide before this. Uh, is this the one? I think this one. Okay, the antrum. Okay. Okay, so um, so this is the left antrum where I already entered the left antrum. You can see that better because uh, this side is uh, has less poly. Uh, but this side, even though um. You know, we have a lot of difficulty in opening up the mesial antrum. We managed to do that. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, nasal polyp inside. Uh, Sorry, Buff, we lost our connection again. Um, Oh, <laughs>
Okay, Prof. I think we've lost our connection again. <laughs> so yeah. sorry about that. I hope it's not my line. Yes. Um, so shall I proceed? Yes, you may continue. Okay. So this is where we uh, stopped just now. Okay. I was showing... Um, you can see this, right? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm showing the dissection around the frontal recess area. Um, as I mentioned that um, when we are dealing with the frontal recess area, uh, it's not going to be easy because um, uh, the frontal recess curve upwards. So we need to use our uh, angle uh, instruments. And this is where usually I use uh, my angle telescope. Uh, I hardly use um, the uh, 45 and 70 unless uh, it is really required. Normally, I use um, 30 degrees telescope uh, because it's not easy doing a dissection with um, you know, the angle telescope. But um, the lemma of the um, the recess is always um, uh, lateral to the Uh, macro divider, the angle macro divider to reset um, the right. You might. Mungkin di cek apa di apa namanya di Oke, okay. sorry Prof. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I know that we broke off just now. Okay. Um I I think probably the uh, Ini sinyalnya beliau banyak nggak sih? Hello. Hello, Prof. Yeah, I think the video is too heavy. Uh, maybe I skip the video. I move on. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, the video is too heavy. Yeah, the line cannot accommodate. Let's see what happened. Okay, I won't play the, the video anymore. Maybe if we have time later on, I can play the videos for you all to show you what happened. Okay. Uh, I won't play this video also because if not, the internet is going to be unstable. Uh, so this is a case of hemostasis in patients with invasive fungal sinusitis. A bad case, usually patient we have uh, uh, is immunocompromised. Uh, in this case, patient has diabetes, hypertension, and also CKD, chronic kidney disease. Um, surprising, this patient actually was not, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the sepsis is not that bad, only fever, uh, and it's a block of we initially treated for um, which thing to tissue but stop spontaneously. You can see the CT scan showed the 
uh, homogeneous density suspicious of uh, invasive fungus and oocytes. Um, the blood, uh, red blood um, sugar, the um, random blood sugar is uncontrolled or was uncontrolled, uh, and white blood cell also was uh, elevated. Um, I won't show this video, but I just want to show the video of hopefully this can play uh, where we ligate the um, uh, the spinopartan artery. Okay. So we have identified the spinopartan artery and we ligate the spinopartan artery. Okay. Why do we have to do this? Because I was, I have to dissect along the uh, postural uh, coena here. I have to remove some of the dead uh, tissues. And that is why I ligate the spinopartan artery rather than doing a dissection and then facing with bleeding from the spinopartan artery around this region. And that's what I did. Okay, so that's the reason why I did Okay, I start the video here because I don't want to cause measure. Okay, Prof. I think. As much as possible now. Um, I just continue with the post operative measures. Okay, so as compared to the pre op and post, uh, the intra op, post operative measures probably uh, there are not many choices uh, for us to choose from. Uh, the post operative measure is just the. Uh, for, the, for us to be careful when we are finishing off to make sure that we have obtained all the uh, proper hemostasis and also we have uh, made sure that all the bleeding vessels uh, have stopped uh, bleeding. Um, so you need to, to understand that and realize that uh, bleeding can still occur up to uh, six weeks after our surgery. And the common time frame is about one and two weeks. Uh, I Sometimes I come across patients uh, within a, a one week period that, um, you know, when they come back for to us for bleeding, and usually it's because of the uh, infection usually. Um, so uh, what are the things that we can do while when we are closing and when we are finishing, uh, we are completing this, uh, the procedure? Uh, we can use a saline irrigation to wash away the blood clot because, you know, sometimes uh, when um, there are blood clots on the any bleeding points, 
uh, if we don't wash that away, we do not know that actually that vessel is still uh, bleeding. Uh, and then when the blood clot were displaced later on, and the patient will uh, have bleeding postoperatively. So that it might be uh, helpful for us. Um, uh, uh, stop mention about uh, when we have uh, any vessels around that uh, region that we need to uh, address then we need to really make sure that it is that's not it does not bleed uh, a common area that we usually may have bleeding is like we are when we are bringing down the wall of the anterospinal sinus where we're going to encounter postseptal artery. Uh, spinal parietal artery, as I mentioned, when you're doing dissection around the posterior coena there, uh, if you um, do not um, ligate the spinal parietal artery uh, properly, uh, you might uh, also have um, a lot of bleeding from there. Um, and also, um, when we are doing septoplasty, you need to sure if you can suture uh, the mucous flap, that will be quite helpful to uh, ensure that uh, there's a proper hemostasis. And usually we don't really need um, to do um, routine uh, uh, nasal packing using uh, the non absorbable like gauze, like metal cell and whatnot. So um, we come to the last, uh, second last slides. Um, uh, as a summary, I would say that um, when we um, want to get a um, good outcome from our surgery. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, we need to properly plan our surgery. We need to plan ahead. And usually this um, involve um, for us to do the pre-operative measures, the interoperative measures, and as well as post-operative measures. Uh, why we are doing this? Because we want to avoid complications. Uh, we want to make sure that when we go in, we have a good uh, surgical feel and thus because the main aim of our surgery is to eradicate the disease, to remove all those disease um, tissues and we don't want to leave anything behind. When we leave anything behind, that uh, will cause a residue, um, you know, uh, and the, usually it will, uh, if there's still blockage, around the opening of the sinuses, this will also predispose the patient for uh, another round of uh, in, uh, sinusitis and whatnot. Um, and there are options available, multiple options. Uh, we can use uh, the, according to our uh, preference. It can be used um, single modality. Uh, it can also be uh, 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 as a compound difference depends on your experience and depends on the availability of the uh, options that uh, in your hospital or center. Uh, and uh, with, hope, with that, uh, so, uh, Hello, sorry. Um, <laughs> did you manage to see the last slides? Yes, yes. Okay, so oh, luckily we managed to join again. Okay. So sorry about that. <laughs> yes, it's okay, bro. Okay, I think 
Thank you, Prof, for the interesting lecture about hemostasis in endoscopic sinus surgery. Now we move to the discussion session. Uh, for the audience, if you have any question in mind, you can type it in the chat box or you can raise your hand. Okay. Dr. Pandu, please. Excuse me, Prof. I want to ask uh, for your presentation. What, what are the preventive, preventive hemostasis strategies that can be applied before endoscopic surgery? So, and as leading in surgery, Prof. Can you repeat your question? What are the preoperative preventive hemostasis strategy that can be applied before endoscopic sinus surgery? What are the preventative measures to apply before endoscopic sinus surgery? Is that the question? Yes, Prof. That can be applied before. Uh, so I think I guess you are talking about the pre-operative measure. Um, are you are you uh, do you, do you want, would like to know more about the pre-operative measures? Yes, pre-operative. Ah, just like I said just now, the pre-operative measure is that you need to identify those patients that has a high risk of bleeding, especially if they have medical condition, they are on medications. Uh, that for example, they have aspirin. Uh, they are one warfarin, uh, they are on no steroidal anti-inflammatory, you have to stop all those medication. All right. But apart from that, um, be aware and I hope that you know that some of the herbal supplement, like I, said, I mentioned for this, the ginger, uh, ginkgo biloba, uh, the ginseng and whatnot, um, they are also um, one of those uh, you know, medication that we need to advise the patient to stop. Sometimes you need to ask them this question because if not, they won't volunteer because they, they assume that uh, those supplement, they are, you know, they don't cause any uh, complications. Uh, they don't cause any blood uh, disorders and whatnot because it does affect their platelet function. Um, and we need to uh, ask the patient uh, this sort of question. So then need for them to stop those medication. Um, and you know that a lot of Chinese medicine, uh, if the patient is using a lot of Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine contains a lot of these uh, uh, modalities or herbal supplements. So you need to ask the patient to stop uh, that medication. And also probably what you will be more interested in is the use of steroids before the surgery. Uh, the use of steroids, either topical or systemic. As I've shown you, uh, some there are evidence to show that topical corticosteroid helps in terms of uh, minimizing the burden of disease, uh, and uh, and also a lot of people also use systemic corticosteroids one or two weeks before the surgery, um, and also in terms of the other modalities I didn't put inside my slide. Uh, there are also some uh, studies that shows that you probably can combine. Uh, steroids together with uh, uh, augmentin uh, in terms of this if I Okay. So just now, now we are, but we are.
Oh, sorry. What happened again? <laughs> you may continue. Okay. So is that what you asked me just now? Or is there any other things that you like to me to answer? Okay, Dr. Pandi, you have anything in mind? No, thank you, Prof, for your answer, Prof. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. Okay. Please, you may clarify your question. Thank you, Prof, for the presentation. I am Vio from uh, Yanti Resident. I would like to ask to you... Uh, you said before that corticosteroid administration preoperative uh, can reduce the risk of uh, bleeding. Uh, I want to ask about uh, what is the corticosteroid administration in improving surgical field during sinus surgery with endoscopy? Thank you, Prof. Sorry, I didn't hear your question just now. You're, you're saying about the topical corticosteroids? Corticosteroid administration preoperative. Preoperative. Uh, what you would like to know? Specifically about the use of typical corticosteroids? Can you yes. repeat your questions? Yes, bro. Uh, you said before that uh, preoperative corticosteroid administration can reduce the can lower is the bleeding in operative. Uh, I wanna ask about what is the role of uh, corticosteroid administration in preoperative? Can improving surgical fit during sinus surgery with endoscopy or not? Thank you, Prof. Okay. Hello, so sorry. Um, so study has shown that the use of topical corticosteroid uh, does offer some benefits in terms of uh, achieving the hemostasis. And I think we need to keep also in mind that how patients use it. Uh, and also uh, if let's say the patient has, um, um, you know, massive polyps, uh, and it's blocking their nose, how the patient uh, can uh, spray inside the nose. I think um, it's not going to be easy. And as I showed you in my, one of my patients, that extensive patients, uh, patient that, that patient has, that has extensive nasal polyps, uh, the whole nasal passageway actually will block by the polyps. And you can imagine if we, are, we, we want to use uh, the topical corticosteroid, it's not going to go inside the nasal cavity. Um, so uh, those are all the challenges. Of course, definitely, we can use topical corticosteroid. We can use systemic corticosteroids. Um, and this might help in terms of uh, reducing the inflammatory burdens. But of course, having done that doesn't mean that we can um, only use that modality. We can also use the other modality interoperatively in terms of uh, using basic constrictor. And normally, what I use is uh, I pack the nose, uh, as I mentioned, with Morphet solutions, right? I use Morphet, um, uh, 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 usually a minimum of uh, twice packing using Morphet solution. Morphet consists of uh, cocaine 10%, adrenaline, as well as uh, the sodium bicarb. I pack inside the nose, 
and you can actually ask uh, a lot of um you know experienced expert usually they say if you can pack it well allow sometimes usually you can get a good hemostasis you don't even need injection and i actually nowadays i don't really uh, give any more uh, local injection in the nose uh, apart from using the topical uh, vessel constrictor i also use hot saline irrigation i flush it and that helps a lot because it clears away all those secretion uh, it clears away all those uh, uh, blood clots as well it also cleans our lens our telescope lens and that's quite helpful to me thank you so much prof thank you thank you prof maybe another question from the audience maybe from our staff dr marisa maybe from the other residents Uh, good afternoon, Prof. Uh, I want uh, thank you for the uh, I want uh, I want to ask about about uh, in the telescopic sinus surgery, uh, does hot sign irrigation improve the surgical field uh, or not, or uh, it does uh, better than the cold? or uh, visual solid irrigation? Uh, uh, I think this, uh, the question is uh, uh, focusing uh, on the silent irrigations. Uh, I, I'm sure a lot of uh, you know us are using silent irrigation, uh, especially when we want to wash this, um, the nasal cavity. We use the room temperature. Uh, but uh, as I've shown you, studies have shown that if we can use the hot saline, hot saline means above 48 degrees Celsius. Huh? So the room temperature is around 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, that is also quite uh, useful in terms of clearing away the blood clots and whatnot. But uh, if you can use hot saline, hot saline has been shown that uh, is better in terms of controlling hemostasis because um, hot saline, the mechanism involved being postulated as that uh, there is interstitial edema and because of that, it compresses the edema, compresses the blood vessel lumen as well as when we flush using hot saline, there will be um, the release of clotting factors and that helps to stop the bleeding. And that's why I said uh, you can use hot saline irrigation uh, ideally, because of the worry about uh, endangering the brain and what not using uh, temperature above 48, we use about 40 to 42 degrees Celsius. Uh, we flush using 20 cc volume, 20 cc hot saline every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes you need to flush, 20 cc every 10 minute flush. Okay. So uh, if you do that, then you can get um, very good control of the hemostasis. Thank you very, thank you very much uh, for the answer. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, bro. Maybe another question from young doctor. Maybe you want to ask some question to bro. Let me see in the chat because uh, there might be people who are in the chat. Oh, there's no question from the chat. Okay, no question from the chat. Maybe if they want to chat, also is also can I can read from the chat if they, they want to ask orally. Maybe for the audience who want to ask directly, you can type it in the chat box, or maybe you can raise your hand. Uh, maybe uh, may I ask you some questions? Oh, sure, please, please do. So, uh, what are the newest recommendation for the uh, technique for the to minimize the bleeding in endoscopic sinus surgery? Yeah, that's very interesting. 
I I actually have not come across any uh, guidelines uh, to say that there is um, you know the number one choice, the second one choice, the third choice, and whether there is any goal uh, standard for hemostasis. Um, if you can see whatever I mentioned just now, whether it's preoperative, uh, interoperative, and whatnot, those are actually being practiced. And what uh, people, our surgeons have been uh, using uh, during their endoscopic sinus surgery, um, either the positioning, the general anesthetic measures to, for control hypotension, um, and the use of preoperative international corticosteroids, uh, systemic corticosteroids, and then using hot saline irrigation, using tranexamic acid. That all has been um, studied, being practiced, and, and as I said, probably there is no single method that is the best. Probably what, whatever you want to do, probably you're going to combine them. You can combine positioning. You can also use DA. You can also use topical or what's it considered. So in combination, perhaps it offers a better value. It also probably give you more optimal uh, setting for you uh, to have uh, control of the hemostasis. So to answer your question, I have not come across anyone that says only use hot saline, only use tranexamic acid, only use topical basal constrictors. And you can see that some of the studies are also quite conflicting. So I think this depends on the your preference, on the patient's uh, willingness, and also what you think is the best. You have to individualize the patient according to each person because no one patient is the same. They have different severity of disease. And probably a patient, you know, where they have severe uh, nasal polyps, then probably you need to be more aggressive. If they don't, they only have mild disease, probably you don't need to be that aggressive in terms of, um, you know, using all those sort of uh, pharmacotherapy maneuvers and whatnot. Because uh, from the patient perspective and point of view, uh, anything that you use on them, we are talking about using combined varieties of a packing topical basal constrictor injection that also can cause complication, bear that in mind. And also, we need to also consider the costing to the patient. If patient has to pay out of pocket, that is going to be a considerable burden to them as well because cost is always an issue. If patient has to pay, and patient can't really afford it. And so all those things come into the picture as well. And I think uh, you know best what is good for you. But all those models that I were discussing just now, all those are actually being practiced um, in other parts of the world and everywhere, actually. OK, thank you very much, Prof, for your sharing. And these are some questions in the chat box. So there are questions regarding common errors and pitfall. Yeah, common errors and pitfall, not only about hemostasis, is that um, you want to do what you are not capable of. As I said, there's no dangerous instrument, only dangerous surgeon, all right? But whenever complication happen, they blame the instrument. They say, oh, this instrument is dangerous. I don't have not come across any dangerous instrument, only dangerous surgeon. So bear that in mind. If you're not familiar with the sinusoidal area, you're not familiar with the uh, anatomical landmark, you have no business in doing uh, an extensive uh, endoscopic sinus surgery. I know that uh, for beginners, usually the entire, um, you know, the entire part of the sinus surgery is quite safe. If you want to do asinectomy, you want to do uh, um, you know, the opening of the mesial antrum, that is quite safe for you to do. But beyond that, you want to go to the posterior sinus, that is much more risky. If you're not familiar with the territory, you can easily damage all those vital structures. All right, so bear that in mind, if you're not familiar, get HEPs. Uh, there is no uh, shame in getting HEPs. I, I know that if you have difficulty and it is, Uh, 
Oh dear, what happened again? <laughs> Maybe because of the weather. <laughs> what, what's happening over there? Is it raining? Is it storming there? It's rainy or not? No, it's not rainy here. Maybe ah. in... It's also clear over here, so I'm not sure. Maybe there's a storm midway in Jakarta, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> so coming back to the issue of uh, errors and pitfall, um, I think you need to understand where you are because uh, let's say you are near the vessels, you cut the vessel, you need to identify them and you need to ensure that uh, you really um, you know, have stopped the bleeding to that. Small vessel usually by packing alone is good enough. But you have a big vessel, you need to put uh, something there to ligate the vessel. As I showed you just now, uh, as part endoscopic spinopartite artery ligation, I put a clip there. Uh, or I datamize over there to make sure that it really is close. So then post-operatively, you know what happened post-operatively? The blood pressure will go up. Even though during surgery, you don't see any bleeding. If there is still a patent lumen, uh, there is a patent artery, actively bleeding, it will going to bleed quite a lot post-operatively. All right, so um, what are the strategies to control the bleeding vessels at risk, as I mentioned? Small vessel, usually if they're just oozing, there's no worry. You can just pack the nose, uh, just do flushing, pack the nose, uh, it should, uh, the bleeding should stop. And as, as I mentioned, before we stop the, um, uh, you know, the surgery, we flush the nasal saline irrigation to identify uh, if there's any bleeding point, remove the blood clot. And also we can also ask the anesthetist to do the uh, Basawa maneuver. Um, you know, you can ask the anesthetist to do Basawa maneuver. When you do Basawa maneuver, the increase in pressure will actually show you where are the bleeding spots. And then you can identify them. Because when you are uh, doing the surgery, you have the control hypotension setting. And you don't see any bleeding. But once the blood pressure goes up, uh, you will encounter some bleeding at that point. And that is why you can ask the anesthetist, uh, can you do the basketball maneuver before uh, you close uh, or you end the surgery? And even uh, after the uh, anesthetist has um, you know, performed the basketball, uh, if there's a bleeding point, usually it will appear. And then you can see, oh, there's still some vessels bleeding from there. And then uh, usually a small vessel, you can just do... Um, uh, diatomy. You can just diatomize using a bipolar. You, okay. Usually, I actually don't use bipolar that much. Uh, because usually after packing, you just put a packing there. You remove the packing, there's no more bleeding there. And after the vessel, also, you don't see any bleeding. And that should be good enough already. But if it's a big vessel, uh, probably what you need to do is cauterize or even put a ligature there. Okay, thank you, bro. I think time flies fast and it's nearly the end of this session. Sure. Sorry about the connection issue that happened earlier. So please allow me to summarize the lectures today. So endoscopic sinus surgery has moderate bleeding risk and bleeding must be anticipated during the surgery. And at it is inherently rich in blood supply derived from the external and internal carotid arteries region. Um, there are three hemostasis strategies that preoperative, intraoperative, and also postoperative, and several techniques has been applied to improve the surgical field during the endoscopic sinus surgery like intraoperative packing with topical vasoconstrictor or use the bipolar diatomy, use hot solid irrigation, combined medication, patient positioning, controlled hypotension, and we have to use uh, appropriate surgical technique and surgical instrument. There are many techniques that surgeon can apply to maintain the hemostasis of patient tailored to the patient during uh, to the patient condition during the endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, thank you, Prof. Baha for the lecture. And thank you for all of the participants for being active in this discussion. Hopefully, we can meet offline someday. And of course, we can continue sharing our knowledge. So now, please allow me to end the today's program. And thank you, everyone. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prof. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih, Prof. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you, Dr. Aziza, for leading our discussion. We have just had an expert lecture and discussion. Hopefully, that today's lecture will give us some new insight in providing medical services to our patients. Once again, I would like to thank Professor Baharudin, Professor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah, Dr. Paramasari Dirgahayu, PhD, Dr. Dr. Hadi Sudrajat, Dr. Aziza Fikisha Berlena Putri, and last but not least, to all of the participants that already joining today. Thank you for your time to attend this international lecture. So this is the end of the lecture. I would like to apologize if there is any mistakes. And it is my pleasure to be your host today. I sincerely appreciate your attention. And also last but not least, I would like to say learning is a treasure that will follow its owner everywhere. Goodbye and see you in the next international guest lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.